there as a professor since the age of 27. Everybody, Gregory Brown. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the game of life. No, go is, go is elsewhere. No, this is the game of life. Uh, this was a, a game, some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about already. Uh, but if you don't, I, I'm going to walk you through some of the basics just so that you have some idea. If you don't know the basics, you're going to be completely lost for the rest of the talk. So I'll go through it. Uh, it this is a cellular automata game uh, that was designed by John Conway, who's a mathematician in Britain in about 1970. He proposed it to Martin Gardner through one of the uh, periodicals. Uh, and at the beginning, he was doing it on, on sheets of paper and doing it out by hand. Now he can do it, thank God, with a computer, so we can go through many thousands of these iterations uh, without hurting ourselves. Uh, it is a zero-player game, so it's sort of a funny game in that nobody really plays. You observe it, really. Uh, it is deterministic. That is to say, when you have an initial state and a set of rules, you always end up with the same final outcome. Our world consists of cells which are represented here as just a grid. And if it's white, it's dead. If it's black, it's alive in this, in this setup here. You apply rules to each cell, and that determines whether it is alive or dead in the next state. And the process is, is iterated either until forever or until everything dies. Well, who cares? Uh, anyone interested in the ways that patterns and self-organization can evolve from the application of, of few simple rules? That's uh, you know biologists looking at bacterium developing in a petri dish, uh, urban planners, physicists, any number of people would be interested in this because when you apply these rules, some patterns emerge which actually do uh, resemble real life natural phenomena. Uh, and me, uh, I'm sort of a strange I actually don't come from the Czech Republic. I grew up in New England. Uh, my dad's a math teacher for 40 years. Uh, my mom was an organist. And I had this very, two very strong streams in the house. I was always doing either music or math. And when I grew up, uh, as much as we try not to be like our parents, I actually became the exact synthesis of both of them teaching music. Uh, so just as a little more, let's look at the rules of how this works. As I said earlier, I don't know if you can see this. Um, well, can you see OK? So we have, we have a grid. And when we go through a state, we evaluate 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. We evaluate each of these grid points. And we look at its neighborhood. We look at all the things around it. If it has less than two neighbors, that is to say, if it has less than two cells around it which are alive, it dies because it's too lonely. If it has more than three, it also dies because it's too crowded. If it has either two or three, it stays alive. It's just happy. If it has three and exactly three neighbors, and it's dead currently, it comes to life. These rules are notated 2, 3, dash, or slash 3. And there are, there are some variations in this. So we'll see later what that notation means. So if we take a simple. 5 by 5 grid. State n is what we have on the left. If we apply the rules to the upper left-hand corner, we see that it has just one live neighbor. So in the next state, state n plus 1, it's still dead. If we look at, for instance, the top middle, if we look at this cell right here, we see that it has 1, 2, 3. It's currently dead. It has three neighbors. So in the next state, it generates. Likewise, if we look at this cell right here, it currently has two live neighbors, so it stays alive. And so on. You just keep doing this forever. Any questions about that? Pretty straightforward. OK, so let's have a look at how this actually plays out when we throw this at the computer. This is a, a Java application called Golly, which is readily available. So this is our first state. And if I hit play, it will do this iteration forever. And let's just watch.
This particular one is, I, I picked this one especially, it's one that lasts for quite a long time. And this will actually go on for another, oh, a few hundred generations. If we go in, uh, let's do it a little, I'll choose a different one and go a little slower. You can watch it. Uh, let's see, let's look at this one here. And I'm going to slow the control way down. Slow down. There we go. So now we can really watch it a little bit better. You can see that some of the, some of the shapes are, are relatively stable. Some of the shapes are relatively chaotic. And if we speed this up, let's see if I can hit the speed here. I guess you can't change. Oh, there we go, faster. You can see that. See the, the two by two squares, they're stable. There are a few other stable things. And then there's relatively chaotic behavior around it. Now remember, this all came out of two little tiny things that, that, that came into this. All right, so you get the idea. People have been fascinated with this for, for a while now. And actually, there, there are long articles about different, uh, different shapes that do certain things. You can actually create uh, guns, which will create, here we go. Here's a very large situation. Uh, can you see that? Those are tiny little cells. If we, if we uh, zoom in. Little Isn't that cool? So people spend a lot of time developing these things. Now keep in mind, keep in mind that this is all comes about as, as very simple rules. Those four rules and a binary universe two-dimensional binary universe. So what does this sound like? <laughs> well, the way I decided to do it was I would place the states one on top of each other and run time in this direction. So we would come across this at time 0, this at time 1, time 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So that's great. But we have another dimension we can deal with. We can talk about left to right being pitch, frequency. We can talk about that being a spatialization between our right and our left channels, or right and the left channels. We can talk about that being some sort of timbre, some different tone color. Um, and there also, since we're dealing with music, we have the possibility of dealing with another dimension this way. So that each cell can not only be alive, but maybe have some other characteristics which interact. The first thing I did with this, and I'll play you, is just a basic one frequency. Each cell is either making a sound or not making a sound. And what that sounds like, let me go out and show you what it, here we go. This is just a simple um, uh, processing. Do you guys know processing? Free, free program out of MIT. Processing is really good at just, you send it data. There's something called open sound control, which is network. It's just a network protocol for sending particularly music commands to one another. And the program I use um, for creating music sends OSC commands to processing, and it just spits out so you can see what's going on. Uh, so I'm going to actually run this in a different program, and we'll see the results in processing and hear the results over the speakers. Well, let's see. Da -da -da. And I'm going to let this run for just maybe a minute or so, and then I'll talk about some of the aspects of it.
OK, so that's, that was sort of step one. There are a few other things going on here to tell you about. Um, first of all, the, the columns are spatialized. So the things on the right, events that happen on the right over here, you will hear predominantly over there and vice versa. And this will sound like it's coming up the middle. So that was some way that I could, I could, I could help give more sense of the experience to the listener. The other thing that's happening, when I was doing this, I was interested in ideas of self-similarity. And one of, the, one of the things I did was that everything sounding in this column, the waveform is generated by looking down the column. So we have, if you want to generate, generate a waveform, we have a bump here, and then a dip, and then bumps, and then a dip. And so that as, the, as the texture changes, the timbre changes as well. You'll hear this more when we get involved with more frequencies, because it won't be such a simple basic, it's almost a, a square wave here. Um, but as we get more frequencies, the, the, the timbre gets more convoluted. Any questions about how this works? Good. OK. The first piece I did in this vein was a piece called Ichabod, which I wrote for uh, a disc clavier, which is a, a it's a, an actual live piano, uh, but you can control it using MIDI events. You can, you can hook your computer up to the piano and play the piano, like a player piano, in, in real time. Uh, and I wrote this. Uh, it's very, uh, there's, there's, there's points when you have something like 40 notes being played at once, which you obviously can't do. 10 figures, 40 notes. It doesn't work. Uh, and also, it's very quick. So when we got, we rented, I was at University of Georgia, we rented, we had this piano, this very expensive piano brought in, and the latency and the mechanism was so bad. I mean, it was just, it wasn't bad, it just wasn't up to the task. So I ended up performing it uh, using just a, a computer patch. Um, and that was, that was fine. I, I'm still waiting for the time when they get a piano that can keep up with this sort of thing, because I'd love to see it played live. What I, what I have now is, uh, what I'm going to play for you right now is a, a realization. It's a little bit glitchy just because of its, it was, the original piece was written with PHP, Perl, AppleScript, and uh, one other MIDI thing. So I mean, it was really cobbled together. And I've taken that cobble and sort of re-cobbled it together so that I could play it today. But it is a little bit glitchy. Uh, so it uses a different rule set. I came up with my own rule set. So instead of those four rules that we use to the game of life, I came up with my own. Where you're looking, uh, in, if, we have, if we had a grid, we'd be looking um, each, it's 88 keys, 88 wide. The grid is 88 wide, which is the same number of keys on the piano, piano keyboard. And there are, I think, uh, eight attacks. So it's 88 by 8. And when you look at each cell, you're looking two attacks back, two attacks forward, and then an octave on either side. And you're calculating the density. And you do that by looking at how far away your, your, your cell is from the next live cell. So if it's, a, if it's a fifth away, it gets a certain score. And if it's a third away, it gets a different score. So you add up and you get a density, a localized density. And you survive, you generate, you die based on the density. And what happens is that you, the rules generate, um, or rather, when you apply the rules iteratively, iteratively, you get patterns, but those patterns are more oral than visual. You'll also see them. They're kind of cool to look at. They look sort of like space invaders. Uh, and the way that the piece is organized is that you get an initial state, and the rules are applied to that iteratively four or five times. You get the initial state again. The rules change and you apply it again. You get the state, the rules change again. So the rules are continuously varying. Uh, you also, at certain times, get a subset of that initial state and have the rules applied to it. And then later, you get two or three different subsets, each having the rules applied on their own terms. So they get out of phase with one another. Uh, what else to say? So it, it, events, it ends up, musically, sounding like a theme in variations, where you have some fixed something, and you get variations on that. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say about that. Let me fire up what I need to fire up here. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and this, this piece runs about five minutes, and we'll watch, we'll watch the whole thing. Good. So something, something just to keep in mind is that that all comes out of a random starting state and a set of rules. 
um, which as a, <laughs> from a compositional state of point, standpoint, I'm, I'm sending just as much time composing these pieces, but now I can compose it at will and come up with a completely different result each time, which is kind of neat. Uh, so you can imagine what, oh, go ahead. Correct. Like eight sixteenth notes. It's like you know you look you play the first, and then you go on, and then you play the next, and then you play so each. Like yeah, exactly. It's, like, it's as if the mu the universe is a measure. Okay. Um, yeah, in this piece, the rules change from time to time. The rules, uh, what happens in this piece is um, the, the, um, the minimum amount to survive and the minimum amount to generate gets higher. And so, uh, or it gets low, I can't remember exactly. It changes, and it changes um, over time. Uh, and I think at the end it changes back as a way of sort of book, bookending the piece. Um, you know, one of the things, when I first did this, it was fascinating to me. I could just sit there and watch it for a while, but I realized that for a general audience, particularly an audience that was used to listening to music, I had to give it some sort of form. I had to give it something, something more. Uh, and the way I decided to do it in that piece was to uh, formalize it uh, almost like a theme in variations uh, and have the variations be variations on the rules. Does that, does that clarify? Yeah. Um, so, so when the rules change, you have said, I want it to change in this way at this point, and I want it to change in this way at another point. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's all set out. That's the form of the piece. Uh, we look at a later piece that's actually different. Uh, I randomized that. Uh, but you, you bring up a good point. When I first came to this idea, I figured, how do you, how do you hear this? How do you, how, I mean, this is a process. It's a process that we can visually see happening in two dimensions over time. But you can't hear two dimensions terribly well all at once. I mean, there are ways of, of doing it. You could, have, you could have it spread out left to right and then loudness. But that, it doesn't give you any sense of depth. Because if you have something that's loud here and something soft back there, that's really hard to understand. So the way I decided to come at it was by coming at it through time, using time as a dimension. And I think to, to my ear, it actually works, works OK. I'm very close to it. The human mind is actually very, very good at um, listening for patterns. Uh, and I'm working with a student right now who's working with uh, Lorenz Attractors and making sounds using Mathematica, actually. You can make sound out of Mathematica. Uh, and tra sort of traveling around and using, using time uh, and also using left and right, uh, loud and soft, and frequency for the three dimensions. And you can actually listen to the attractors as it goes around. You can actually hear it both in pitch and loudness and left and right. It's very interesting. Uh, but I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we see people doing more of this, because the human mind uh, through ear, through, through your hearing, is actually very perceptive at picking up very subtle variations in, in texture, in pitch, uh, picking up patterns. Um, and in some ways, I'm, I'm guessing that there are data sets which are actually easier to hear than they are to see. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see much more of that um, now that we have the ability to very easily oralize data sets. OK, moving on. Oh, where are we here? So I played you that, that basic version with the little blue dots. That's, that's all well and good. I decided to add some more frequencies. So our, our starting pitch, our starting universe now has uh, pitches between uh, uh, you know, low pitch and a high pitch. And as things are generated, they are generated close to what they're near. It looks around and says, what's near me? Takes an average and sort of inserts itself close to that average. Uh, likewise, pitches that survive tend to move towards whatever the average is. So you get these sort of basins of pitch as it goes through. Everything else is the same. Let's see here. Uh, 
And I'll let this run for a couple minutes so you can watch it. So you notice that the color corresponds to the frequency, and you get these sort of basins, basins of pitch. Uh, the rules are still the same. The, um, the universe wraps around the edges. I found that when you cut off the edges uh, with such a small world, that the behavior around the, around the edges didn't, didn't, it just wasn't terribly interesting. So I, I wrapped it around and made a torus out of it. Uh, you can see that. As a musician, one of the things that interests me very much is that we see, we hear rhythms developing, we hear melodies developing, and this sort of static, there are some static elements that you see, and they come back. They form a sort of musical basis. One of the things that, about music is repetition. And we hear this repetition. We hear things rep repeating. You also can see things moving, and they crash into the things that we get. And so, so sometimes the pitches start to move, the rhythms start to move, and Musically, that's very interesting to me. We've still only been dealing with one rule, one rule set, and that is the standard 2, 3, slash 3. We can very easily uh, begin to mess with other rule sets. And what we have now, let me pull this up here. So it's the basic thing where we have, where we have pitches having affinities to their neighbors and moving towards them. But now we can change the rules. And we can invoke some other, some other algorithms to generate states. So what we have is we have the standard life 2, 3, slash 3. And that goes along for five or six iterations. And then I randomly change the rules, sort of like real life. The rules change all of a sudden on you. And it starts to generate a different sort of pattern. Um, again, think about self-similarity. The way I generate the, the frequency of the changes has to do with, if you look at the rows of the initial state, however, however many um, relative, however its relative density, that's how long the first set of rules will be applied. So if we have 32, rule, 32 uh, rows, we have 32 changes. And they happen uh, relatively, um, the duration of each state is relative to how, how many elements are in the initial state. So again, uh, a little bit of self-similarity in there. All right, let me fire this up. And I'm going to let this one run for, I think, about four minutes until it is, I think it dies after four minutes.
Any questions about how this all works? All random. Yeah, the, fir the first state is entirely random. Whenever a cell generates, it looks at what's around it, takes the average, and then I have a, I have a little um, variable for affinity, and I just multi I have a random random number. I think it's you know 100 within a, a 50 hertz times this affinity, and if the affinity is very small, then it's, it's actually very close uh, the way it's set up. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I've just played with these until I got something which made sense to my ear. I, I, there's no real, no, no math. I mean, I just I set it up, I knew what I wanted, and then just played for hours trying to get it to make some sort of musical sense to me. Well, uh, it, is, it is a matter of sort of moving the sliders until things start to, to make a little bit more sense on a, on a human scale. Um, and certainly, we have, we'll probably have some time. If you want to come up and we can mess with some of the numbers and see what happens, I'd be happy to do that with you. Yeah, yeah. In fact, this this one is one that I found last night, which I particularly like. So I, I have a, I have a random seed, and I just I, I sometimes it dies after three, and I didn't want that to happen in public. So I I put in the I I, I fixed the deck a little bit on this one, uh, but yeah, it sometimes is very interesting, and sometimes within five generations, only one pitch lives. Yeah, you know, there's there's one particular rule, one slash one, where if you get it at the wrong time, it kills almost everything. If you get it at the right time, it moves things around very interestingly. But it's, it's, I'm still sort of in the process of figuring out what, what all the ratios are. And, and I'd say probably half the time it's pretty cool. Half the time it's, you know, control C and start again. The previous example, mm -hmm. everything would die out for a while and then it would just spontaneously come back. Yeah. Is that a rule you had then, or was that? That probably, you can't really see it, but if you, um, the rules are changing uh, up in the, up here you have there's a you can see the rules changing. That's that'll that'll give you the current rule set. Um, and sometimes rules work really well in certain states. Sometimes they work really poorly. For instance, one one slash one will kill everything if it's tight. But if you have it relatively sparse, things pop out. And so it, it sort of just depends on when you get the rule and what it looks like, what the texture is when you hit it. So you just have a couple safety rules in there say there's too much dead stuff. Right now it's all random. Right now it's all random. And I think what I'll do, because I mean I, I like the idea of things dying out. I think that's that's nice. But what 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 I can do, uh, either I can stack the deck when I do it in public, or uh, I can have it just when I can just check and if everything's dead, new state, start over. Sure. Or do the same one again, but apply different, you know, the random rules are going to come up different. That could be interesting. Start with the same state, with the same durations, but have the rules change. Uh, you know, have the rules not be the same sequence. So I was playing with this last night, and I realized that, well, I think this, the photo will say it all here. Oh, Oh, I've got one other thing to show you. Uh, which will just take a second. I, I wondered what this would sound like in one dimension. I was, I was dealing with the waveforms. And you can actually, uh, with just one dimension, an array, look, uh, apply similar rules. Uh, and what it does is that the waveform changes over time. And we usually think about enveloping being uh, an, amplitude, uh, an amplitude thing, where you have low, high, and then it sort of dips off to make it sound a little more natural. Well, this is what I call dynamic texture enveloping, 
with um, you just have a one uh, a one dimension adaptation. Hello, something's hung. Well, that's different. I am hung. It looks like. Oh, I wonder if it's a battery thing. Oh, are we back? Nope. All right. Well, as they say, that never happened before. And I mean that. I'm guessing since I forgot to plug in, I'm actually low on battery. It's freaking out. So what I'll do is I'm going to just unplug this, put in my battery. Hopefully it will wake up and you can hear the final example. Uh, I do. It's a little bit of a mess at the moment, but um, I'll put that up. Oh, <laughs> I just took it down. It's GregoryWBrown.com. You would be surprised how many Gregory W. Browns there are in the world. I went originally for Greg Brown, but it turns out he's a folk singer in Iowa City. I went for Gregory, uh, Greg W. Brown. I, a G.W. Brown is some lawyer in Texas. And uh, eventually I had to go out for the whole, whole nine yards. So it's something like 18 characters, but it's mine, all mine. Okay. Well, I'll take questions while that's re, uh, rebooting. <laughs> I have not. I have not. This has been sort of one of my little quirks. Uh, I'm presenting a, a version of the, th the thing I just played next week at a concert. I teach at the College of Worcester, about an hour and a half south of here. I'm um, having a concert next Thursday night. If you're in the area, I'll be performing uh, that piece. Um, but other than the other one, which was performed, the one with the uh, player piano, that was performed at Georgia about four years ago. Um, but other than that, no. None of it's been published. That'd be interesting, though. Who, who, would, who would read such a thing? <laughs> in, my, in my regular life, I am a, I'm a choral conductor. That's what my training is. And, uh, my secret life, yes. By day, mild-mannered choral conductor. By night, electronic beep boop maker. As my as a one-year position. Yeah. So, yep, I conduct two choirs and teach composition and electronics and music technology. Before that, I taught at the Putney School in Vermont. Um, before that, I was at the University of Georgia, uh, doing primarily choral conducting. I'm, yes, a troubadour in the old sense. Did you like to make shade a later to the professor of electronic music at the city? Oh, great. I'd love to. Judy Stone wrote a show. May have done, she may know of some journals that did that. Been on board with her. Well, I would be curious to do that. All right, we are back in business. Sorry for the delay. Uh, so again, this is texture enveloping, or that's what I'm calling it at any rate. Um, and it is set up to run through a MIDI keyboard. Obviously, I don't have a MIDI keyboard here, so I'm going to run it just off of my laptop keyboard. But you'll hear how, when you apply the rules, the states change, and so the waveform changes right with it. Yeah, I, I turned it off. I had to plug in. There's nothing really to see, anyway. Yeah, I've mapped it to the, keypad, to the keyboard. So again, it's just simple rules, a random original state. This time it's, I think, it's an array of 36 floats. 
and I generate a wave off of that, and away you go. So that's, that's something I've just been playing around with. Right now, uh, the, the computer I'm working on can handle about three or four notes at the same time, or else it starts freaking out. Oh, it's behaving today. Sometimes it freaks out when you hit four, so it's behaving. Good. A uh, stronger computer could probably take many, many more. Uh, and the last thing, any questions about that? We could, you, if you want to come up afterwards and play with that, you're welcome to. I've got a little, what I call a faux oscilloscope, which shows you what the waveform should look like. The last thing, I was playing around with this last night and realizing that I wondered what it would sound like, what, what the previous thing would sound like with a backbeat. And so I took James Brown's Funky Drummer and stuffed it in the background. And uh, it actually sounds pretty good, believe it or not. So we'll go out on that. Oops, come on now. There we go. All right. So that's what I do with myself late at night. <laughs> Thank you. And if you guys want to come up, and I'll be happy to play with it with you over my shoulder or vice versa.